All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Kingdom Dynamics. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and we are live and on the air. Uh, good to have with us tonight as my guest, uh, my wife, Dr. Faye Hanshu. Uh, good to have uh, Dr. Kay Fairchild watching, uh, and uh, I believe I have her scheduled uh, up not too far down the road. Next month, we've got Brian Simmons, the author of the, 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 Mirror, uh, the, the Passion Translation, and uh, many others. So... Uh, good to have you all. Uh, Dr. Fay. it's good to have you back on the show, and welcome. Thank you. It was good to be on Tuesday night show, and we had this one scheduled for last Thursday, and we had family come in, so we postponed it, and so we're back tonight, and um, hope you all enjoy. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so good. So, um so tonight uh, we're talking about, and I've I've had some uh, a major technical meltdown this week, and so getting my teleprompter to work and getting um, everything uh, going, I'll have to just really try with my my mouse instead of my my remote. But anyway, uh, we're talking about with God as one, uh, and I want to just kick this off by saying that you know we literally have been. Uh, made to believe that we're somehow out of Adam and that we're separated from God and um, all of that, which none of that is true, uh, but that's how we've been uh, taught to believe. And so, you know, I just think we didn't wake up one day and all of a sudden we were with God and that's the way it worked. No, in reality, I think what it is is that we've always been with God. I don't think it was one day we woke up and experienced Jesus, which that moment we would call salvation or being saved, and all of a sudden that moment we were now with God. Well, the fact is that Jesus was the Son of Man who came from God, but the question uh, is, did all mankind come from God? And I think that's really the focus of tonight is, did everybody come from God, or we're just, we're just out there randomly on our own power, apart from God, separated from God, uh, able to uh, be who we are, to have jobs, to have uh, families to procreate, to do all of that stuff. We just somehow are able to do it all without a, a higher power or without a deity. Well, the fact is, is that uh, there's more to the story than that. So I want to read to you tonight from uh, uh, John chapter 1. And uh, let me see here. Okay, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 from the Passion Translation says, In the very beginning, the living expression. Now, we know that the King James or the New King James would say that the Word was with God. But it says the, at the very beginning, the living expression was already there. And the living expression was with God, yet fully God. They were together face to face. Now, this is a very important statement here. I don't know if we'll have time to get into that face to face issue there uh, in the very beginning. And through his creative inspiration, this living expression made all things. I want you to hear that. This living expression made all things, for nothing has existence apart from him. Now, when we come to verse 4, this is one of my favorite verses in the beginning of John chapter 1. It says, life came into being because of him. So, your life, supernatural, 
or earthly had no ability to exist apart from his light. For his life is the light, or we could say the illumination for all humanity. And this living expression is the light that bursts through gloom. Uh, the light that darkness could not diminish. Now, there's a lot to be said about that. We could look at a lot of translations, but uh, we're really not going to have time to get into uh, everything. So, uh, having said that, uh, Dr. Fay, I know that there's some things here that you are seeing, uh, and I, I want us to talk about those uh, because uh, when when we look at this verse, the reference in the very beginning, uh, the Passion Translation footnotes reads: the first 18 verses of John are considered to by most scholars to be uh, the very words of the ancient an ancient hymn or poem that cherished, was cherished by the first century believers in Christ. And I can say that's probably very true. As a theologian myself, I would say that there's many Old Testament writings that really point to these moments because there was no New Testament at this time. Uh, and which shows us how they value the ancient scrolls in both song and meditation. Uh, I think that's a very important point. So in the beginning, the scripture says the living expression was already there. Uh, which we're going to talk about this word tonight. And Dr. Fay has uncovered some things about this word, this Greek word, logos. Uh, we have called it logos because of our English enunciation of words and the way it looks grammar grammatically. But it's logos in the, in the Greek. Uh, so no matter how you pronounce it, this refers to the eternal Christ. Uh, Dr. Fay, one of the greatest revelations I have ever received uh, that's ever unfolded in my life was that of that Jesus was more than the Jesus of 33 and a half years that he was the eternal Christ and and uh, even though it's not written that way in scriptures um, you know that's really important now I want to make one little statement here and then I'm going to get Dr. Fay to talking here uh, we find that this text has a rich and varied background in both Greek philosophy and Judaism I think that's very important for us to understand with everything the content that Dr. Fay is going to use tonight uh, it's said that the Greeks equated logos with the highest principle of cos cosmic order and I'd love to talk about cosmic order tonight but I want to get Dr. Fay on this share with us tonight where you're at, what you're seeing when it comes to uh, John 1 and verse 1. Well, as we start out with verse 1, in the beginning, the, in the very beginning, the living expression was already there. Who was that living expression and why does the scripture use the term living expression? And I know all translations don't, but why did this translation use the term living expression? The living expression is talking about the word logos, as you said. Did you know that in the New Testament, the word logos is used and has a wide range of meanings? And I want to go over some of those meanings because some of you may have not studied this before. I know many of you probably know tons more than I do on this, and I'm, I'm just getting a picture of it. So um, I just want to go over maybe three or so uh, meanings. And the first one is in Matthew 21, 24, Jesus was in the temple, the priest chiefs, the chief priests, I'm sorry, and elders confronted him and asked him a question. Jesus answered them and said, I also will ask you one thing. We see that the word logos there was a question. I also will ask you one thing, the words that Jesus used, that was a question. In Galatians 5.14, it says, for all of the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here, the word logos meant command. It was a command that Jesus gave. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That was what the words were. In John 6 and 60, it says, this is a hard teaching. The word logos was a declaration or a teaching because that's what the words said. It was a teaching. So we can understand with this and there's tons and tons more where we can find different meanings for that word. Um, so now we go back to John 1 and 1. The word as it says in the New King James Version, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Any occurrence to Logos has to be carefully studied in its context to, in order to get the proper meaning. 
Now I want to submit something that I have found while I was studying, and maybe it's different than what you understand. And you know, I could be wrong, you could be wrong. So we'll just listen to each other and see how it turns out. Um, so just hang with me. I do not see that the word logos in John 1 and 1 means the actual Jesus. Jesus Christ is not a lexical or a literal definition of logos. The verse does not say in the beginning was Jesus. The word is not synonymous with Jesus or even the Messiah. The word logos in John 1 and 1 actually refers to Father God's creative self-expression, his reason, his purpose, and plans, especially as they are brought into action. It refers to God's self-expression or communication of himself. Now, this is talking Father God. This has come, and, and, you know, a lot of people get, they'll, they'll say, they'll, they'll use the word God, and they're talking about Jesus. They'll use the word God, and they're talking about the Father. You know, God is only a title, like mm -hmm. King James, Father God, or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is the title. They are the triune, um, but I do not believe they are the same as far as the person, just like our son and Dr. Bill are both Bill Hanshoes, but they are not the same individual person. They have different mannerisms. They serve different purposes, just as the same as Father God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit serve different purposes, but they are one in thinking and purpose and everything else. So um his reason purpose and plans especially as they are brought into action it refers to god's self-expression or communication of himself this has come to pass through his creation and that's proven in romans 1 19 and 20 because what may be known of god is manifest in them for god has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen by understood, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And also, especially the heavens in Psalms 19, where it talks about the heavens or the celestial realms announcing God's glory. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. And on and on. It's a beautiful passage. If you haven't read Psalms 19, it'd be good to read it. It has come through the spoken word of the prophets. It has come through the scripture, which is the written word. And most notably, it has come into being through his son. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, I've taken this from the voice translation, and it says, long ago, at different times and in various ways, God's voice came to our ancestors through the Hebrew prophets. But in these last days, it has come to us through his son, the one who has been given dominion over all things and through whom all worlds were made. Even here, it talks about his son. The word logos then denoting both reason and speech was a philosophical term adopted by the Alexandrian Judaism before St. Paul wrote to express the manifestation of the unseen God in the creation and government of the world. It included all modes by which God made himself known to man. As his reason, it denotes his purpose and design and as his speech, it implies his revelation. The Logos is the expression of God and in his communication of himself, just as a word is the outward expression of a person's thoughts. This outward expression of God has now occurred through his son. And though it is perfectly understandable why Jesus is called the word. Jesus is an outward expression of Father God's reason, wisdom, purpose, and plan. For the same reason we call revelation as a word from God, and we call the Bible 
the word of God. Dr. Bill? Yeah, you know, you know, Dr. Faye, the, the, the thing is, is that I think that's what the, uh, the authors of scripture a lot of times had in mind when they used an uppercase W or a lowercase W for word, which you will find occasionally in the Greek writings, you will find uh, in the Strong's Concordance or the Thayer's Lexicon or various others, a lowercase L or an uppercase L uh, and when they're talking about logos. Um, yes. Well, I just wanted to input there that I also found when I was studying that there's different meanings for word when it has just word or it has the word. There's there's totally different meanings there, too. So you really have to study when you're studying the scripture to find out which ones and what the meanings are there. And, you know, as I was talking to somebody today, that's really a thing right there is how willing, uh, how how far are you willing to go in your studies? Uh, how far are you willing to go in terms of, are you willing to uh, go beyond the norm? In other words, are you willing to go beyond uh, just staying in the box of what we get from the King James Version and what we get from um, various other translations such as that? Uh, how far are you willing to go? And I think that's a really important thing uh, for us to to think about how far are you willing to go? Are you willing to, literally to see God in the light of of the context of truth? And you know, for me, I was willing to go outside the box a long time ago because I was not getting the answers that I really wanted. And and so that's where all of us we have to say, you know what? Uh, I'm willing to go as far as Revelation will take me so that I can find out what it is Father's trying to say to me. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to skip around a lot of things tonight and try to keep you uh, uh, talking, uh, so, to, so to speak. I know you love that. Um, but, but the thing is that uh, when we talk about the original text in the, in the King James or, or in, in our, our studies, uh, what we find a lot of times is that... Um, and uh, let me get back to this here uh, again. These, you know, I'm a person that I, I'm challenged by technology, but uh, sometimes I'm te technologically challenged. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but we find God's logos in the Old Testament as His p powerful self-expression in creation, revelation, and redemption. And I love that because the Old Testament, creation, revelation, redemption. We don't have to wait to the New Testament. It's already been expressed in the old. I think God, you know, one of the things I teach emphatically about is how that Father always was there interacting with his creation in the Old Testament. Uh, and how we read the scriptures oftentimes is, is their version of their interaction with God based on their human experience. And when we do that in life, we really get a, a skewed uh, version of who we think God is. Also in the New Testament, we have uh, a unique view of God given to us by John here, uh, which I love John chapter 1. John 14 is great as well, but I love uh, 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 these scriptures. Uh, it's the, And here it signifies the presence of God himself in the flesh. So as I have said, uh, the presence of God is the same as being with, so you and I, uh, we're married, we're in each other's company a lot, and that's the same thing as being in each other's presence, okay? So we really don't understand presence because in the Old Testament, uh, there were certain things they didn't have words for, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I'll not uh, uh, go into that, but... Uh, so, so Dr. Fay, uh, these words, uh, the living expression uh, was already there. The living expression was God. The living expression uh, was fully God. That's what the scripture says. And a footnote says the living expression, Christ, uh, I love to say eternal Christ, had full participation in every attribute of deity held by Father, uh, God the Father. The living expression existed eternally as a separate individual, but essentially the same as one with the Father. And I'm going to stop. Um, uh, let me say one more thing. When we talk about this face-to-face, -face, I didn't know we'd get to this this soon, but this face-to-face -face concept, 
Uh, the, the thing about it is it's actually, I find, often translated as face into face. And it shows my oneness with my creator, even though we don't always have a clear understanding of that. Like Dr. K. Fairchild often says, you know, it's, it's a fine line uh, concept. Um, but, but anyway, uh, in the Hebraic uh, concept here, they convey, convey uh, that of being before God's face. But I think it's even deeper than that. Now, there is no Hebrew word for presence, even though we're in each other's presence, like as in the presence of God, but only the word face. So they use the, you know, in your face. <laughs> That's not a very nice expression sometimes, but it's face into face, meaning that we are uh, uh, of Father's face or literally of his very essence. Dr. Faye, talk to us some more if you would. Well, like I was saying, Jesus is an outward expression of Father God's reason, wisdom, purpose, and plan. You know, when anybody says, I got a revelation, they're usually talking about Jesus speaking to them, not Father God. Mm -hmm. And so when they get that revelation, though, I believe it's like, you know, how we've always heard in the past that Jesus is the mediator between us and God. Well, we're kind of different with that now, but it's like, Father God and Jesus works together and maybe one of them gives them the meaning of something and, and Jesus translates it on down to us if we can't understand it or whatever. Um, but what you were saying about study and that, you know, good Bereans, I, I throw that word out there a lot. Be a good Berean. I tell our mm -hmm. students that um, because you have to study to understand the word. You can't just read a scripture and that's it. And you think you know it all. We have a lot out there that do that. But, um, you know, that's that's not the case. And one more thing before we leave John chapter one and verse one, when we read history, we find that most Jewish readers of the gospel of John would have been familiar with the concept of God's word, word being with God as he worked to bring his creation into existence. Now, you mentioned something and I don't like to get into the point of disagreement because i think we're saying the same thing and maybe in different ways oh that's but, all right we already knew this was going to be just a tad bit controversial but but when he brings his creation into existence i believe god is my creator so there had to be a point where god created us but i do believe that we were created in with god we didn't wait until Adam came and then we were created by Adam. We oh, were I with agree. God because in Jeremiah, it talks about God had plans for us. God knew who we were and where we were going and what we was going to do and everything. And that was way before Adam. So I believe that we were all there with God. And then as Dr. K says, we were just shipped down through that uh, birth canal. And during that transition from being with God and understanding and knowing all of his plans just like he did when we got here we kind of got amnesia I guess we probably slept too long in that birth canal and we <laughs> forgot we forgot what God's plans were for us so that's why maybe Jesus was on earth and maybe he you know, had people write the scriptures and write the books so that it could give us a hint because I believe the Old Testament is our schoolmaster. It's not a bunch of rules that we have to abide by. We're not under the law. We're under Jesus. One commandment that we love each other, you know, and love our neighbors ourselves, that sort of thing. But um, there's an obvious working of God's power in Genesis 1, as he brings his plan into concretion by speaking things into being. The Targum was an originally spoken translation of the Hebrew Bible that a professional translator would give in the common language of the listeners when there was no Hebrew. The Targums are well known for describing the wisdom and the action of God as his word or logos. This is especially important to note because the Targums are the Aramaic translations and paraphrases of the Old Testament, and Aramaic was the spoken language of many Jews at the time of Christ. Remembering that a Targum is usually a paraphrase of what the Hebrew text says, 
Note how the following examples attribute action to the word. I have some examples of this. Genesis 39 and 2. And the word of the Lord was Joseph's helper. Do we see how that word was a helper? It's an action verb. It does something. In Exodus 19, 17, and Moses brought the people to meet the word of the Lord. Now, how can you meet something if it's not there? So that, mm -hmm. that word was there. Uh, Job 42 and 9, and the word of the Lord accepted the face of Job. Psalms 1 and 4, and the word of the Lord shall laugh them to scorn. Psalms mm -hmm. 106 and 12, they believed in the name of his word. There was even a name in it. These examples just demonstrate that the Jews were familiar with the idea of God's word referring to his wisdom and action. This is especially important to note because these Jews were fiercely monotheistic, which means monotheism is the belief that there is only one deity and all supreme being that is universally referred to as God. Mm -hmm. And they did not in any way believe in a triune God. They were familiar with the idioms of their own language and understood that the wisdom and power of God were being personified as word. Then John writes about the when the eternal Christ, or as stated here, the living expression was face to face, which you mentioned with his father, which was in the very beginning, as it sta is stated in scripture, both in Genesis 1 and 1 and in John 1 and 2, which speaks of the beginning. Dr. Bill? Yeah, wow. Yeah, that, that's a lot. And it, it's very important for us to know uh, these things. And, you know, uh, everybody listening tonight, listening to, to, to college professors talk, and talking uh, a little bit, uh, both with degrees in theology, talking about um, how this all works. But anyway, yeah. So there's a footnote that says um, in Genesis, it is the beginning of, uh, Genesis, it is the beginning of time, but John speaks of eternity past, uh, a, a, a beginning before time existed. And, you know, we can read Genesis 1 verse 1, and I think it's very feasible for us to say a lot happened in Genesis 1 verse 1, but I think it's okay uh, to say that um, uh, also a lot happened before Genesis 1 verse 1, which John has a revelation of that. And so what the, the this uh, footnote says, the living expression is Christ who, is, who existed eternally as part of the Trinity. He had no beginning uh, being one with the Father. Now, please keep in mind that uh, Jesus has no beginning and no end. Father God has no beginning and no end. Holy Spirit has no beginning and no end. They just exist. So I think it's important, people that study and try to find out when did God first exist, uh, it's a wasted study to me. It's a waste. There's so many other things you can study on because if you look at script, Scripture, Scripture consistently lets us know that he had no beginning, he has no end, and always is. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Since we came on the scene, Genesis 1 and the tail end of verse 1, uh, the, the word, uh, the, the Hebrews didn't use um, um, uh, heaven and earth like we do. Uh, they used they used something else as a figure of speech. They used the word universe describing one. They weren't into duality. But that word earth is very important. The Hebrew word eretz. And it really means a, a people, uh, more than a planet, a people, uh, a species of people. And it's really the species known as mankind. And so in the beginning, uh, being one with the Father also be one with the eternal Christ. We were created as the species known as mankind from out of nothing and yet made face into face with our Father. I mean, I, I think that's a phenomenal uh, perspective. I, I really can be a mind-blowing perspective that we're uh, seeing here uh, because this living expression, as I've already said, you know, he made all things, literally all things, uh, even happened because of him, and there was nothing that happened apart from him. And that's even my life. 
uh, nothing. Uh, I mean, you know, how, how many times can we say nothing uh, and not mean anything other than nothing? Um, so uh, I, I want us to go ahead and jump just a little bit. I know there's a lot can be said about verse 2 and 3 and uh, um, I, I think some of this is tied together, but I want us to jump to verse 4, uh, uh, John 1 verse 4, and I want to read this from the Net Bible. Uh, the New English Translation says, in him was life. This is the, he, the Greek word zoe, D-Z-O-A-Y in its enunciation, zoe. And the life was, that life was the light of mankind. Uh, 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 and I'm going to try to skip around here and not give all the details of what I've come up with. But I want us to see something very important here. Uh, the Message Bible says what came into existence was life, capital L, like you see in the K K New King James uh, for word. Uh, it was life, and the life was the light to live by. Now, both in the Message Bible, all three words, life, uh, life, life, and light are capitalized. I, I think the bottom line here is, is that uh, both the species known as mankind and the human form of our life only exist because of his life being imparted within uh, us as the light within mankind. So uh, let me uh, uh, turn it over to you and let you address this. Well, the thing I find fascinating about this scripture is in the New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. And in verse four, it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Since the kingdom is in us, according to Luke 17, 20, and 21, it says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Yes. Now, we, have a, we have a good friend, Pastor Jimmy Lewis, and he always used to say, you can't have a kingdom without a king. So if the kingdom of God is within us, the king is within us. So Father God is within us. He lives in us. The scripture also says in Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this scripture also says that Christ lives in me. So if Father God lives in me and Christ lives in me, then the light is also in me period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's where the light is. So we shine in darkness. Now, where is the darkness? If Father God lives in people and Christ lives in people, is there darkness? Or is it just as, um, you know, mistaken identity and the darkness is not even really there? Is Christ darkened out simply because people do things that they shouldn't do? Or is it that Father God and Christ is still there, but the people uh, have that mistaken identity. So they're just not understanding that Father God's there. They're not understanding that Father God loves them so much. And if they did, if they understood that one thing, how much Father God loves them, then they wouldn't even be worried about anything that's dark. Yeah. <laughs> So, Dr. Fay, let me just say this. Uh, I, I'm personally one who don't believe in darkness. Now, uh, what I believe darkness is, uh, because because I, I deal so much with people who are looking for uh, dark and evil entities who can overtake us, who can, in a sense, possess us, and etc. Uh, I just literally believe that uh, darkness is a state of a lack of understanding. And so, you know, if you walk down the road and you very, you know, uh, judgingly say that a person uh, is not a Christian, uh, for example, what you're doing is you're not understanding that all that's wrong with that person is the degree of darkness they operate in. Now, the person that's judging 
I would say also operates at some level of darkness. Uh, I think we all have a degree of darkness uh, in our thinking, but thank the Lord that light has entered because his life is the light or the illumination uh, within all mankind. Now, my recent experience um, at the beginning of last week, I believe, someone asked me, uh, uh, one of our professors, Pastor uh, Rick Watts, sent me a message, and he asked me, what do you, what, if you can nail it down, what do you believe was really the, the, the thing, the catalyst that really caused this, this uh, experience in you? Well, I had to say, you know, uh, the entrance of the word brings light. And I took that word light that means illumination, and I added a word to it that I, I call saturation. I think it's just the saturation of revelation that finally oozed out of my soul and overspilled into my body, and my body had a reaction. I think saturation, I think the entrance of his word brings brings a, a, a huge amount of saturation into our bodies. So uh, I, I don't know if you were done with what you were saying there, uh, but... Um, okay, uh, so in, and verse 4 says, for his life is light for all humanity, uh, which is translated uh, accurately from the Aramaic, they say, but it also can be translated as the spark of human life. So uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of Man, who also is the Son of God, uh, birthed forth the light of eternal life but he also birthed something else for it that I, I've only seen this very few times. And it's always, I find it in the footnotes of the Passion Translation, uh, that he birthed forth the full revelation of God. Why is that true? Because the full revelation of God's always been in us. Uh, we've always had, but we just didn't understand it. Why? Because dark, darkened thinking covered it up. Now, uh, as we as we jump to verse five uh, and get ready to close, uh, I want you to to uh, offer what you have on this. But First uh, John one verse five says, "And this living expression is the light that uh, bursts through gloom," uh, which can also be interpreted to say uh, keeps on shining through. Uh, I just like to say think this way that that the light of who God is shines through even when people don't want it to. Uh, I don't think you can get away from the light. I think that no matter how big of a degree of darkness, because he also says that the light, uh, the light that darkness could not diminish. Uh, the Greek here has a double meaning, which is that uh, darkness could not diminish this light or could not comprehend it. So uh, any, uh, if, if you're dealing with people who have darkness in their thinking, you know, I talked to someone today, uh, and I talk to people every now and then who are still fighting devils and they're still battling. And I just encourage them, you know what? Rest. Okay, enter a state of rest and stay there because that's where you were created. Um, so uh, do you see darkness as anything more than uh, just um, just what we've been talking about here? Well, no. And, and the thing that came to my mind when you mentioned that is if you go into a room where there's no light, no windows, nothing, and it's as they call it, pitch dark, and you strike one little match, just a mm -hmm. tiny, tiny little match, it'll light up the whole room. Mm -hmm. And so with Father God and Christ living inside of us, our life is already a light. There, there is no darkness. It's, it's got to be something else. And um, I think what you have said also, I know I see it in your notes and maybe you don't want me to go on to that, but go ahead. darkness can also be a metaphor for the sons of darkness, but allegorically refers to the darkness of thoughts as in to lack the full revelation of the Christ mind. Now, what I see in that is the darkness of thoughts is you don't understand. And that's what I was saying a while ago. You don't understand Father God's love for you. If you understood Father God's love for you, everything else would come. That illumination through revelation, uh, through what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, or from the word, the different ways that that comes, then it would come to you because you would be open to hear it. You know, a lot of times we have so many thoughts ourselves. We keep our thoughts going and going and going so much that we close up our mind to hearing what father has to say to us. And so if we close our, close our thoughts off and listen to father God, 
then he's going to give us the true meanings of things. And yeah, I don't think there's darkness at all. I think that that what we've called Satan in the past and the devil and all of this stuff, it's it's um, how we train our mind and how we look at things. And, you know, I mean, it's really silly because people i think are using things like that as i brought out on tuesday night they're using things like that just to have a cover-up or to have an excuse of things that happen to them if they get in a wreck they'll say somebody will say well father god let them have that wreck just so they wouldn't meet in a bigger wreck on down the road or they'll say uh satan made them have that wreck because he was trying to kill them so they're they're trying to say you know either way um either father god did it or satan which we understand that satan is just a mindset it's not a person it's not a guy with a a pitchfork and a long tail and all of this stuff you know they've they've turned this word into so much that they actually really scare kids when it comes to halloween or whatever I mean, they've got so much of the, the devil and things they thought he was. I mean, if they would actually say the truth of it, there wouldn't be nobody scared of him. There wouldn't be nobody looking to blame him for anything because he's not a him. It's not even a person. It's not even a an entity. It's just a bad thought. You know, that's, that's really good because... Um, and, and neither one of us had any idea we were going to go here. But um, the, the, the truth is, when you look at the um, when you look at the first century, for example, and they talked about someone being Satan, which Satan is an English word. Uh, it's not a, a, a Hebrew word. It's not an Aramaic word. Th those words are are Satan and Satanas and etc or devil is diabolos in the uh, Greek language. But when you look at those, they have specific meanings that relate to people allegorically to the thoughts within our own soul. And, and so if someone in life begins to needle you, begins to harass you, uh, begins to cause you trouble, do you know that you could call them Satan and you could offend them and start a, a fight? But the reality is, is that uh, they are uh, literally um, an adversary, and that's the word, adversary. Um, and so even if you look at devil, you know, that word is defined as a traducer, or, which also leads back to an adversary. So uh, but, that's but the Dr. thing Bill, about thoughts. Yes. Bring that out if you would. An adversary, I would say, you know, when I was working for the government, I would say an adversary is someone that comes against your plans or or thoughts that you have to do things better in the work or whatever. Explain to people, you know, if if Satan is an adversary, exactly how that works. Does it not work through other people just putting you down or things like that? Well, speak of the government since you brought it up, <laughs> and I have nothing bad to say about the government. But in the first century, uh, literally, there were two factions that began to uh, historically work together. That was the Pharisees, and that was the, the governors or the rulers of Rome. Now, you understand, if, if you were to go to an antique shop today, and you were to buy a marble bust or a head of Caesar, uh, they made those because the emperors wanted to be seen as gods and wanted to be worshipped as gods. And by joining up with the Pharisees who were the promoters of the law and promoters of Judaism, they wanted to create a one world religion. Uh, and, and so uh, the fact is, is that uh, when you talk about uh, those that we see in the book of Revelation, which again, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book, not a literal book, but there are pictures there. There are things that we can see, such as they had to have a mark on their right hand or their forehead, which uh, really the right hand is the hand of power. The forehead refers to not a 
t a tattoo, but it refers to a branding. It's an allegorical for a branding on your mind or your thoughts. And they had to have that mindset or that agreement with Caesar or whatever uh, a ruler emperor was in power and, and to even buy uh, food or to sell their goods that they raised. So, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the religious community, this is what I call religion. Do Is there such a thing as religion? Of course there is. Uh, the scripture says that the greatest religion, uh, that's to take care of widows and orphans and, and, and etc. And so we do understand that. But the problem is, is that we've gotten so used to, I mean, I, I said it to someone this way today. We've come into this world we came here upright, but we also at the same time were indoctrinated by our parents, by our Sunday school teachers, by our leaders, and we were taught a lot of things, and we really did not know uh, the truth. So, so we kind of forgot. We kind of entered a state of amnesia. So yes, Dr. Fay, uh, the government was a key factor as an adversary. They were very adversarial toward the people. Who were the Pharisees adversarial towards? Particularly these young Jewish people who were followers of Christ, the teachings of Jesus. So uh, that can happen in your community. When our government tells us we must think a certain way, such as COVID. I told someone today, let me tell you how I deal with COVID. I said, I don't even believe in sickness. I mean, I literally, I dealt with some things in my body. But to deal with them in your body, to go through it and set that aside and say, over here in my thinking, this is who I am. I'm whole because my father is whole and I refuse to be bound by or controlled by something that I'm preached to by our own government or by our religious community. Don't have church. Shut your churches down. Don't get, you know, that's both promoted by the religious community as well as the government. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a coalition of the mind of not and uh, not literal, but as uh, the mind of a one world government, religion and government agreeing. See, this is where we get into Roe versus Wade, separation church and state, uh, all of those things. Uh, separation of church and state never meant separation from our Father, just so we can agree with our government. Thank God for the government. We pray for them. We love our leaders. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to let darkness overtake me. Roe versus Wade in 1973, and it had to do with abortion. You're right. You're right. I knew that as soon as I said it, and I knew I knew that, that you'd straighten me out on it. Cause, cause you know um, I wanted that to read something that Dr. K. Fairchild wrote in our uh, little um, chat. chat room. Yeah. She said, Jesus said, agree with your adversary quickly, referring to people. And why is that important to agree with your adversary people? You know, who, who are people who, you know, that's the adversary. And that's what I was thinking is that they are people. Thank you, Dr. K for confirming that. But you know, if you disagree with them now, you know, I mean, government, what we was talking about, they have rules, they have things that, that you have to go by. And right. if you disagree with them, you pay the consequences, you know, you get in trouble. But if it's just two or three people talking and say, we get on here and we disagree with each other about a subject on the Bible, it's better to just let each person have their say and not disagree totally. Because if you do, then um, it's going to what I said Tuesday again, it's going to cause war. And right. most of the wars that are caused in our country are from religion. They're religious wars. And they're because one religion didn't agree with another religion. Well, you know, people that don't believe in religion at all, that's a religion. You know, whatever you believe <laughs> becomes a religion. So I, I will not get on there and you know, we came from old time Pentecost and then we came through the charismatic and then we came through kingdom and and all different kinds of things. Uh, we learned something from each one of them that we was in. But of I course. will not get on here and I will not tell a Christian just because they believe the way we used to in old time Pentecost and they don't believe in maybe they don't believe in a woman wearing pants or maybe they don't believe in a woman having her haircut, which I do. I've just grown it out because Dr. Bill likes it that way. But, you know, a lot of different <laughs> things they don't believe in. <laughs> um, 
you know, a lot of people don't believe in having Christmas trees simply because they say it was a pagan. I do not agree with that. And I will give opinions, but I will not come on somebody's and say, you're wrong for your belief because no. of this. I will get on my own and I will tell the truth about it. So you tell the truth when you're teaching, you don't get on somebody's and put them down for their you know, belief because you gotta be careful. You might've came from that. So would you have wanted someone to come on there and put you down when you were believing that? Thank God that uh, we don't believe some of the things we used to believe. And I thank right. God for giving us revelation and moving us out of that area. But at the same time, Father God loves those people just as much he loves you and me, you know, so I think we ought to be careful and we ought to uh, not put down religion just because it's not what you believe. That's yeah, when, when you single out uh, individual religions uh, and begin to tell how bad they are, I, I, I think you're doing an injustice to them. You're not you're not spreading the love of God to them. I wanted to say that I have um, a friend in India. I have known this young man for several years. He's married now and they're expecting a child, but I knew him before he was ever married. And right. he was really down and depressed and, and was in the place that he wanted to just commit suicide. And I remember several times staying up and talking to him and telling him how much his life was worth and telling him how much Father God loved him. And, you know, he came out of that. And to this day, he still tells me, thank you for being there. But um, he gave his heart to Jesus. And during that time, he wanted to be baptized. And we found someone in India um, who had his pastor come and baptize him. Well, this person, I said all that to get to this person. This person, I just received a video and this person's pastor um, is put with a Mormon and told they're, they're going back and they're talking about why the Quran is the right um, thing to read. And one of them's telling why the Bible is the right thing to read and what you go by. And I haven't got to, to listen to all of it, but they were very kind and everything to each other when they opened up the they had a mediator in the middle and when they opened up, they were very kind to each other. And that's the way we should be. Just because we disagree with someone doesn't mean we have to start a war with them. And you know, that's, that's what leaders and a lot of people in our country do not understand is let people believe the way they want to, but at the same time, don't start a war with them, love them. That's what Father God does. And every one of those people that believe different than you, they are still Father God's children. That's right. Uh, and, and you know me, I, I love to talk about uh, Father's creation, all that, uh, everyone that belongs to him. So uh, in conclusion tonight, um, this last statement here, the living expression, also known as the eternal Christ, is the light, uh, the scripture said, that bursts through the gloom of darkness. You know, that's what darkness of mind really is. It's just a state of gloominess. It's like, what's the point? And also, it is the light that could not and does not diminish at all. Uh, it can't break through the darkness. It can't stop the darkness. It can't, it can't bring any harm to the darkness. I mean, I don't know how to say it any differently, but it's so important. Yes. I, I think you missed something in that. It's, um, it's the light that darkness could not and does not diminish at all yeah but once there's a light there darkness cannot do anything to diminish it it can't get rid of the light the darkness can't i mean it's like what we say once you've seen it you can't unsee it right people have asked me about you know can you ever go back can you ever uh, i think you can if you went back into traditional ways legalistic ways for example i think you could numb yourself uh, to the truth, but I don't think it'll ever go away. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and you and I've had a lot of opportunity in the town we live to. We visited several churches before COVID. Uh, and, um, you know, we didn't find really anything that was, you know, as you say, our cup of tea. But we did in the process find some wonderful people. And, um, you know, 
uh, you've got to ask yourself, you know, how much can I join in with wonderful people and can I allow what they're saying to influence me even if I've come to another place of revelation? Well, that's something we all have to deal with and we all have to face. And so it's, uh, it's anyway. just an opportunity to share the revelation that you have seen with them. And once they uh, understand that revelation, they won't be able to go back either. Amen. All you got to do is show them one little thing to make them hungry. And they say, you know what? I've kind of always believed that. I kind of get that. Uh, tell me more. And uh, it just kind of opens the door. So anything else, Dr. Faye? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be on tonight. We're really busy in the school. June 25th is, uh, no, I'm sorry, June 18th 18. is graduation. And then in August, we will st be starting um, our next block up with a brand new system. Hopefully, we will not have to be messing with paperwork and, and homework anymore. Um, Miss Jamie Moody is who is uh, working with all of this with us. And I, I praise God so much for her because it's been a nightmare, this block. We've, I put so many classes out there because the students needed them to graduate that now we're having a hard time getting them all graded. So um, we, we're busy 24 seven, just pray for us. And once this block is over, hopefully it'll be easier. We have gone since what, March, 2018 now uh, with our school. So we're in our fourth year. Oh, two thousand and uh, our what? Fourth year, uh, March the fifth. We started year four. Two thousand nineteen. Eighteen to nineteen to twenty. Uh, not not eighteen. We just moved here June eighteen. Okay, nineteen. Okay. Well, anyway, we just started our fourth year, and wow. um, it's it's uh, awesome. I. I get notes all the time. Uh, this one person, he sent me a note and he's been with us now almost since the beginning. And he's uh, up for his second graduation. And he said that his congregation has even seen a change in him since he's come to WBSU. And they tell him how, how much they appreciate the change that they've seen in him. And we get those kind of testimonies. Dr. Bill has gotten uh, phone calls and messages from people wanting to know what certain scriptures understand. Uh, there's one minister that is over several, several churches, and he is teaching what he learns to the pastors of those churches. That's what it's all about. You don't give it to them just to let it stop there. And so we are very proud, very happy about WBSU, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do in this next year. Yeah, um, I mean, We've already, since our new website, got a lot of applications. And if it's okay, I would like to announce that we are starting something new. I was supposed to have it out on Facebook yesterday. I just made a little mention of it, but I haven't actually got it started. And that is the, a foundation for children. And we're calling it the Tree of Life Foundation after our first orphanage that we've helped. And our first thing we want to do is to raise $5,000 to help them build the home for the children. Uh, where they're living, um, they cannot keep up with the rent. They just do not get enough money to keep up with that rent, but they've had a piece of land given to them so they can build a home. It will have to not be a very big home as far as this way, but they can go up in stories. So, um, and that will work. You know, if you can't go make it big on level one level, go up to two or three levels. But yeah. anyway, that's our first thing. So if you would like to help with that foundation, I will get it out there and I will have, um, one of those things where you can give, I forget what you call them, Dr. Bill, but um, fundraiser. I'm sorry, a fundraiser, a fundraiser. Yeah, we'll get a fundraiser out there. And if you would like to give or, you know, anyone that has the money to just sponsor this whole thing, um, that would be great. Yeah. And uh, uh, we appreciate all of you. I'll be posting some links when we're done here. Uh, if you want to partner with this ministry or if you want to, um, um, you know, th there's so many things we do, so many things we offer. You can go to uh, wbs-u.org. Uh, uh, yeah, dot .org. Uh, um, you can put a www in front of that, uh, www.wbs-u.org. 
and you can see all the things that we have, all the things we do, all the things we have to offer. And I know there's something that you can get involved in if you'd like to. Uh, we welcome you and say bless you. Thank you all for watching tonight. If you would, please click like and share. And uh, join me in the morning. We're finishing a series with Apostle Shane Mason. And uh, I think there's some good stuff you're going to hear tomorrow. We love you. Uh, we'll see you then. Bye-bye, everyone.